Quick disclaimer, all information, content, and material of this podcast are the opinions of the speakers and is for the informational purpose only and not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation, diagnosis, and or medical treatment of a qualified healthcare provider. Welcome to the Untethered Podcast. I'm your host, Hallie Balkin. I'm a certified orofacial myologist, feeding specialist, SLP, and mentor. This podcast is all about getting your questions answered and collaborating with colleagues to bring you the most up-to-date information in the orofacial myofunctional therapy, tethered oral tissue, and airway space. I challenge you to keep an open mind and join my mission to get this information out to the masses. Let's get started. Welcome to episode 89 of the Untethered Podcast. Today we have Dr. Mariana Evans joining us. Dr. Mariana Evans is a board certified dual specialist in orthodontics and periodontics practicing in the greater Philadelphia area. She received her DMD degree in specialty training at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Evans frequently lectures on skeletal expansion, guided facial growth, interdisciplinary care, and periodontal plastic surgery. She co-founded Orthoperio Institute and recently developed 4D morphotrophic orthodontics expansion protocol with a focus on airway and periodontal health. Mariana, thank you so much for joining me today on the show. I'm excited to have you here and to talk about innovations in maxillary expansion. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor to uh, join you today and to share with you some of the exciting things that are happening in orthodontics today. Yes, yeah. So we, we don't I actually, you might be the first, I think you're maybe the second orthodontist we've had on the podcast. Um, there is an orthodontist in the dentist's office that I work with closely. And so she's been on, but you know, we really haven't had I'm trying to think back. I think it's mostly been dentists. So I'm excited to hear, you know, from your experience, your expertise. I know you, that you're in the research world as well. So you've got so much amazing knowledge to share with us today. So let's let's dive right on in. Um, can you share with our listeners just a little bit about your practice, just so they understand your background and what you do on a day-to-day basis? Sure, so I uh, am dual trained in orthodontics and periodontics. I practice right outside of Philadelphia in Glen Mills and uh, Newtown, uh, Newtown Square area. Uh, I, uh, mm, on a daily basis, I uh, uh, see the majority of my patients are orthodontic patients, adults and children, and uh, I still do some of the periodontal procedures for orthodontic patients, such as imp- management of impacted canines or impacted teeth in general. I treat a lot of uh, children and adults with uh, congenitally missing teeth. I do uh, a lot of soft tissue augmentation, uh, bone grafts around teeth, and uh, the only thing that I had to give up uh, periodontally was uh, dental implants, uh, sinus lifts, and uh, conventional uh, periodontal therapy for periodontal disease. So the majority of my practice is focusing on uh, skeletal development, in patients with malocclusion, in children, in adults. We do a lot of orthognatic surgeries uh, for patients with uh, sleep apnea or any type of craniofacial uh, growth problem. And uh, uh, we do a lot of protraction, uh, in other words, bringing maxilla forward. This is a very common problem today uh, because the facial uh, structures are just not growing. And uh, Uh, Our patient pool is getting younger because we realize that uh, we can do so much more in a younger age. And uh, also we are getting more adult patients that have not been uh, skeletally developed uh, as children uh, when they underwent orthodontic treatment many years ago because what we have today was just not available back then. Mm -hmm. It's a very exciting time in orthodontics today because we are learning more the connection between uh, facial development and uh, breathing. And uh, I think uh, that my functional therapy is going to be a very critical part of it because the majority of patients that have malocclusion, that have any type of skeletal deficiencies and require uh, treatment uh, have also myofunctional disorder, uh, improper tongue posture, and they will need some kind of retraining and the muscle strengthening exercises to to get to the 
to the new normal for them. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, having me today. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, and you bring up a great point. Um, as a certified orofacial myologist, you know, and speech pathologist, I um, also specialize in treating pediatric feeding. And it's just so interesting. I, I started really um, a long time ago working on pediatric feeding, but at the same time, I was also working with children who had severe speech sound disorders. And it wasn't until I got into the Mayo world that I started to look at all of them very differently because like you mentioned, you know, it's getting younger, your patients are getting younger and younger. And we're recognizing that these children have myofunctional disorders at birth. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, it's not, it's not just something that can develop, it can be there at birth. And so um, that's changed my practice even to look at these babies that come into our practice and moms that I speak with, you know, is your baby's mouth open or closed? Let's start there. Like, can you hear them breathing? You know, just asking some of those questions. And I, I think it's really amazing the work that you're doing because if we, you know, in my opinion, if we can get in there younger and we can treat these patients earlier on, like how much better will they be, you know, set up for the future when their airway is maximized and, you know, everything is where it should be. So, um, so yeah, so I'm excited to learn about, you know, the appliance work that you do and what would you share with us? Some of the appliances that you commonly use, whether it be a child versus an adult, you know, what does that look like in your practice? Mm -hmm. So uh, the big part of our practice is maxillary development because uh, maxilla uh, is just not growing in, in modern population today. And I think um, maxilla sets the tone for the growth of the mandible for the position of the tongue and uh, I think um, as part of orthodontic treatment we really have to focus on understanding uh, the maxillary deficiency and addressing it. The good news is that maxillary deficiency is reversible uh, in children and today in adults. We have technology where we can expand adults without surgery utilizing uh, temporary implants. Uh, so temporary implant uh, expanders uh, uh, like MSE, uh, acrylic type of expanders are a very big part of my practice today because without those bone anchors we cannot get the skeletal correction uh, that uh, these patients really need. Uh, with tra uh, traditional appliances have limitations because uh, with removable expanders or with uh, pure tooth supported expanders in all the patients we achieve mainly uh, tipping of the teeth. So we are not getting uh, the change at the base of the bone. And I will share with you some of the um, information today on uh, what is happening to maxilla when it's not growing, how it should be growing. Uh, in order for us to answer some of these questions, uh, because the research is so limited, we have to go back and study uh, maxillary development in pre-industrial skulls. Uh, we are very lucky in Philadelphia, we have at the University of Pennsylvania Anthropology Museum, one of the largest collections of pre-industrial human skulls uh, from all over the world. So it's a very diverse collection. And uh, we, um, uh, me, Dr. Boyd, and uh, Dr. Juliana Zoga, who recently joined uh, me uh, in my practice, Dr. Reem Abdul Rahman, that also joined us recently in the practice, we were able to get access to this collection and take CBCTs of the uh, skulls and study them uh, from all possible angles uh, in terms of the anterior posterior development of the skulls, horizontal and vertical development. Because the uh, norms uh, and the information uh, that we use uh, to diagnose uh, today, uh, today's faces is based on uh, faces that uh, of the past uh, 100 years and the majority of our faces have uh, shrank over the last 100 years. So we might not be using the right norms today uh, to fully reverse and treat uh, facial deficiencies. So I can either share with you some of this information now or we can continue yeah. talking. Yeah, I would love for you to share it with us. Um, I think that's absolutely phenomenal that you're so close to the University of Pennsylvania and they have, you know, such a wide variety of schools. So I, I knew you were doing this work. You'd shared that with me, but I didn't realize how wide, how vast the, you know, different schools were, how many there were, they were, you know, 
from all over the world. That's really, that's really fascinating. And I know there is a lot of discussion in the Maya world about, you know, our faces are shrinking, our jaws are shrinking, everything's collapsing on each other. And um, there's just not enough research or information out there. And like you said, the norms are based on already collapsed, already shrunk jaws. So already, you know, facial complexes. So that doesn't help us much. Um, so this is very, very interesting, especially to me. And so I'm, I'm excited to hear about what you have to share with us. So let me see if you can see my screen. Can you see it? I can't. Oh, yep. Now I can see it. And for anybody who is listening to the podcast, um, this will be on YouTube as well. So you'll be able to visualize what we are looking at. Mm -hmm. So I just want to share with you a few slides uh, based on our research and our findings in our practice. So we are going to talk a few minutes about Maxilla. So Maxilla is a very important anatomic structure in your face. It's located in the center of your face. It is a critical structure for respiration, mastication, vision, aesthetics, and speech. So the integrity of the maxilla is very critical for function uh, of uh, occlusion and also of respiration. It's very important for periodontal stability. The skull on the left is the treated skull where we develop maxilla, so you can see that uh, the teeth are positioned uh, in the center of the bone. There are no penetrations of the roots through the bone, and they are axially positioned in relationship to the man mandibular teeth. Uh, on the other side, on the right side of the slide, you see the red maxilla, uh, which is very deficient. And uh, you can also find that the maxillary teeth are flared, so they are no longer upright. Uh, the patient does not have a posterior crossbite, but uh, the maxillary teeth are flat to properly fit or to allow the best fit with mandibular teeth. So this is a very common finding in patients with maxillary deficiency. So when maxilla doesn't grow, the tongue doesn't have space in the maxilla to rest uh, properly on the palate. And the tongue actually should be growing the maxilla from the very beginning of life. Uh, so when maxilla doesn't grow, the tongue has to go somewhere. And the best the position for the tongue is going to be the lower jaw since it's attaching to the lower jaw. So you can see in the skull with deficient maxilla, the mandible is significantly bigger, more massive, and uh, is uh, broader because of the lower tongue position. So we find it commonly in patients with maxillary hypoplasia. So we wanted to study maxillary development to the very depths of it. We want to understand uh, and answer the question to which dimension we should be expanding maxilla because today we don't have the, that answer in orthodontics. Uh, we know uh, how maxillary teeth should be relating to the mandibular teeth, but that only answers the posterior portion of the maxilla. It doesn't give us any information on what, how much to expand maxilla to accommodate the anterior portion of the dentition and also the tongue. Uh, so we uh, actually took our project at the University of Pennsylvania back to pre-industrial humans, to the collection, Morton collection uh, of uh, pre-industrial skulls that came from all over the world. And what we uh, find based on our research that today's maxilla is shrinking in three planes of space, horizontally, uh, in the anterior posterior direction, and it's also getting longer. As it's getting narrower, it's getting longer. So we have a lot of dental alveolar extrusion with uh, vertical growth of the jaw structures. We also have widening of the mandibular base and we also have flattening in the malar area or the cheekbones. That probably explains that uh, we are not breastfeeding our children today as uh, biologically and genetically is uh, meant for, for the children to be breastfed. So interesting that all of the skulls in the collection come from different parts of the world. So there is, they are very diverse in terms of ethnicity, but the majority of them have wisdom teeth in occlusion, wisdom teeth that are worn, 
there is space for them, even if they are not erupted in younger uh, sp specimens. So it's definitely something that we don't no longer see in today's patients. The majority of my patients that come for orthodontic treatment will never have room for the wisdom teeth. The wisdom teeth usually get impacted and need to be extracted because our jaw structures are not growing forward and in the horizontal plane enough. So this is some preliminary data from our study that outlines where the sh we see the shrinkage. So the shrinkage is happening at the red lines on the skull. On the right, uh, this is the one of my patients with maxillary deficiency versus the pre-industrial skull. You can see how much shrinkage you get in the mid face at the level of the maxilla. And you also have a significant change in the mandible. So be, because most likely the tongue is displaced to the lower jaw position, the lower jaw is going to get wider. And that's what we see when we compare patients to those pre-industrial skulls. So we have changes in the proportions between the upper and lower jaw, which we haven't had um, throughout the whole history until the post-industrial changes happen in our environment. So here you have the face of the patient uh, in relationship to the uh, silhouette or the outline in blue of ideal anterior-posterior facial development. So in the sagittal plane, uh, maxilla and mandible should always be ahead of the forehead, should always be ahead of what we call the labella line or the most prominent part of the forehead. But today's faces are just not growing forward. This is one of the reasons why we don't have space for the wisdom teeth and a lot of my patients won't even have space for the canines or second molars or premolars. So severe is really deficient. And uh, on the, the skull on the left is uh, the pre-industrial skull. So you can see that there is a very flat occlusion and significant development of the maxilla and mandible. And look at the skull on the right. This is one of my patients look how massive the mandible looks in relationship to maxilla. So if I make maxilla of the pre-industrial skull the same size as maxilla of my patient and superimpose them, in 3D you can see how much wider the mandible gets as maxilla gets narrower. And we already have uh, some papers in the literature uh, showing that uh, the narrower the maxilla gets, the wider the mandible will get because the tongue still has to go somewhere. So instead of sitting on the palate, it's going to develop the mandible or overdevelop the mandible. So we also have to remember that today's hypoplastic maxilla is very common. It's a pandemic problem. It accommodates the majority of the mal uh, skeletal malocclusions. You can see it in open bites, in class three, class two, class one crowded cases. And as I said earlier, it's a 3D problem is most commonly underdiagnosed jaw problem because we just didn't have CBCT imaging until recent uh, years. Uh, so there is no way for us to diagnose it properly without this imaging because clinically, there is a lot of compensation at the level of the teeth, which um, kind of masks and hides the true skeletal deficiency. And because it's so commonly underdiagnosed, it's very commonly undertreated problem. And the most important part that you need to take from today's presentation, that it is reversible. You can reshape uh, maxilla, uh, that uh, maxillary bone in children and today in adults without surgery. So when we look at our study and we try to understand it, so I think it comes down uh, to the tongue. The tongue is the king of the mouse and the tongue, uh, the king of, <laughs> is going to sit in the throne. So instead of sitting on the palate, uh, where the tongue no longer does because of the most likely uh, insufficient breastfeeding, when uh, introduction of pacifiers, introduction of very soft uh, diet uh, from a very young age, and uh, eating soft diets throughout life, uh, mouth breathing, you develop this orofacial dysfunction where the tongue just displaces from the very beginning of life into the mandible and uh, doesn't function on the palate, doesn't grow the palate. 
so what uh, we see on the CBCTs of our patients usually that lower tongue position, collapsed palatal wall, those narrow uh, higher palatal arches as you can see here. This also comes along with very narrow nasal passages. Uh, most of these patients have anatomically narrow passages and also have uh, possibly allergies and significant nasal congestion. And uh, so what we do in orthodontics is basically we can reshape the palate, we can make it flatter, we can make it broader, and by reshaping it in the horizontal direction after a certain amount, like five millimeters, we also find that maxilla develops forward, and so you can have also uh, more space for the tongue in the anterior, posterior direction. And in some patients, we do see automatic tongue repositioning to the palate, but in the majority of the patients, it doesn't happen. And uh, that's when we need to engage a myofunctional therapist to retrain that king after we move the throne to the palate, to sit in the throne that is now on the palate because the habits that develop throughout life are very persistent and, and are very difficult to break. So just because we expand the palate doesn't mean that the tongue is automatically going to go and sit on the palate. So there is definitely a very significant need in that interdisciplinary treatment. So here you have a pre-industrial skull from Morton collection on the left, and you can see that beautiful palatal development, uh, that beautiful space for the tongue all the way from the roof of the mouth to the base of the mandible. In the middle is one of my patients before expansion. You can see that low tongue posture. This is a child, actually adolescent patient with sleep apnea, who was uh, a preemie born in 26 weeks, uh, who was never breastfed and had sleep apnea basically from birth. We know that premature birth is a risk factor for sleep apnea. These children have a lot uh, of uh, myofunctional uh, problems, uh, deficient jaw structures, and this is how much we were able to reverse that uh, skeletal deficiency, open up nasal passages, and now this patient doesn't have a sleep apnea anymore. So we have incredible technology today to be able to do it. So the way we do it, we utilize uh, special bone anchors, as we did in this case, that open uh, mid-palatal suture and other a circumaxillary sutures that allow metafacial change. And you can see here metafacial change where we have widening of the nasal cavity. We have nice uprighting of the maxillary dentition in the basal bone of the maxilla, so the teeth are positioned in the bone. We have the change at the level of the cheekbones when you look at the relationship of the cheekbones to the mandibular ramus. So the changes that we can do to the facial skeleton are very dramatic today. And this is the change in the patient's face. Uh, so you can see that the teeth fit uh, much better than prior to treatment. You have good occlusion. She has room for wisdom teeth to erupt in occlusion. She uh, has nice projection of the cheekbones and uh, just is so much healthier. And we were able to do it without orthognatic surgery. And this is the patient four years after expansion, two years after we removed the braces, and you can see stability. And she's not really great at wearing her retainers, but the teeth are indicating that there is stability in the function of the tongue. There is a harmony between the function of the lips and tongue because the teeth are not shifting. And so I think the technology today is fascinating. This is the same patient before and after. Look at the change of the palate. Wow. Uh, this patient did not undergo any type of face mask therapy. This is the change from expansion alone, utilizing the bone anchor. So you not only see the change at the level of the teeth, look at the change at the floor of the uh, palate, basically the base of the palate. This uh, sig significantly not only got wider, but got longer. And this is the child, again, with sleep apnea, where we had to achieve this result with uh, several rounds of expansion. So 
the limit of the palatal expansion today is actually not in the palate itself, it's in the ramus of the lower jaw where you have the uh, muscular attachment that will limit how much you can expand that uh, maxilla. So it's a three-dimensional change. So when you think about growing bone in medicine, in children that have some kind of growth bone deficiency, we are talking about human growth hormone. So in orthodontics today, this can be done without need to use human growth hormone, without need to use any type of surgical intervention. Uh, and uh, this is what is achieved through distraction or osteogenesis. It's a physical stretching of the facial bones, jaw bones, without drugs and without hormones, with orthodontic, uh, orthopedic skeletal expanders. And so there are different types of expansion uh, that is available to our patients today. And surgical expansion, as you see in pink, still is an option for adult males that are older than 25, that have thick bone, that probably are not going to respond uh, without surgical intervention. And the best uh, results that we see and the literature right now is confirming that um, the non-surgical expansion, as you see in the center slide outline in blue, uh, at, at the level of the maxillary and circumaxillary sutures will be the one giving you midfacial change and that midfacial change will give you significant nasal change and shows that that are going to be improvement in the sleep apnea parameters or breathing parameters in uh, patients. And there is another type of expansion called dentoalveolar at the level of the teeth. Uh, this is something that we achieve mainly with removable appliances or with uh, purely tooth supported expanders in all the patients, in all the children. So th there is definitely a place for any type of the expansion in orthodontics, but we have to get to the right diagnosis and get the right uh, expander for for the problem that the patient has. If it is a skeletal problem, that means that probably for all the patients, we are going to use uh, mini screws to expand without surgery if they are candidates for non-surgical expansion. If it is children, we are going to use probably bonded expanders or expanders that are going to give us more skeletal change. And if it is a dental valve problem, then sometimes we can even uh, stretch periodontium with arch wires, or we can utilize uh, any type of other dental valve uh, expanders, uh, such as removable expanders um, uh, in general. So ideally we find that it's probably best to treat in a younger age. In a younger age, the bones are more moldable, are softer, the suture, sutures are more patent, and uh, we can uh, achieve much uh, significant, more significant skeletal change. In all the patients, uh, it's becoming more challenging. We also have to remember that uh, if somebody underwent orthodontic treatment with expansion, doesn't mean that the skeleton was corrected because it depends what appliance was used and how the measurements were taken to determine whether the expansion was sufficient or not. Uh, here we have two patients uh, on the um, age of 17, between 16 and 17, that went through uh, phase one orthodontic treatment with expansion and then phase two orthodontic treatment with uh, braces. And you can see that the uh, maxilla is corrected in one to very nice outcome and in the patient on the right the, there is definitely persistent maxillary deficiency. So just because somebody was expanded doesn't mean that maxillary deficiency was corrected. Uh, we know that skeletal expansion will improve uh, occlusion and also will improve um, periodontal support. So a lot of our patients that are periodontally very fragile, with severe crowding, with block, uh, blocked out canines or uh, premolars, as you can see on the left here. And once we expand, position the teeth back in the bone, get those teeth uh, in axial loading, the periodontal tissue, just like the dentition, respond and they look healthier, they look stronger, they look uh, more resistant to uh, gingival recession and periodontal 
breakdown. This is one of the patients with sleep apnea. You can see uh, when they started, they had severe, severe crowding with blocked out canines and how much we were able to correct uh, this problem skeletally. You can see the changes in the patricine bone on the buckle of the teeth. You can see the changes in the nasal cavity. So we are very, very fortunate that uh, we are able to offer our patients this treatment today. Yes, if you have any more questions, you can always join me on Facebook. I uh, have a group that we share a lot of this information, Orthopedia Global Forum, and we are open to my functional therapists, not only dental uh, providers. And you can also email me with questions. And I'm going to just switch to uh, back to stop sharing my screen if you have any questions. No, that was phenomenal, and I know that, um, again, if you guys were listening and you felt a little bit lost, go to YouTube. We'll make sure that you can you want to visualize what Mariana was sharing because, I mean, the, the before and after images, they speak for themselves. It, they are incredible, and you can really see the maxillary deficiency and all that dental crowding, and it just makes so much sense that, you know, one of the last examples you shared, you said the child had severe sleep apnea, and you could see how impacted the the bite was. I mean, there the malocclusion was severe. The there was definitely um, visually when you can see these images, it just drives it all home. So thank you for sharing that because to see that and then to see the after and to see that every you know the top and bottom jaws, you know, the maxilla and mandible fit together and that one is not deficient compared to the other. Um, the visualization of that and seeing what it should look like, I think, is very helpful, especially to people who are not in the dental or ortho space, you know, myofunctional therapists um, who maybe don't have access to this information all the time. Uh, it really makes sense that, well, our symptoms will disappear when we have a face, you know, the oral facial complex actually supports the airway and supports breathing and supports space for the tongue to exist in the palate. Um, so, you know, I don't have a ton of questions, but, you know, I, uh, I think you covered everything beautifully and it really goes back to a lot of other conversations that we've had here on the podcast regarding, you know, we have parents sometimes who listen to and they say, well, what can I do for my child? And we know breastfeeding is a great idea if you're able to, um, you know, obviously we want to feed the baby. So whatever that looks like, that's what's going to happen. But um, we know there's a big change in that. And there also seems to be a shift back towards breastfeeding because awareness and education is increasing in that space, which is great. Um, but we do still struggle with that soft food diet in our, you know, in, in the United States of America. Um, and I don't know if that's global. I don't know if you have more information on that, but I know that it's definitely an issue here. Do you have any insight on whether soft food diets are global or is it really contained to certain areas? In the it's definitely more of a problem in the developed countries, but I think it's becoming global yeah especially as the food industries that uh, manufacture snacks and process like snack foods uh, spread to de developing countries i think it's becoming a problem in, in those countries too but um, i think uh, that there is something that can be done and um, obviously we need more research but i think if we can start eliminating or controlling one factor at a time and see how much by changing that factor we can uh, change the uh, development of the face. Uh, I think uh, it will be interesting to see. For example, I um, originally come from Ukraine and I uh, was raised uh, in the last uh, 10 years of the Soviet Union times. So the Soviet Union uh, thing was definitely a bad thing, <laughs> and that's why it just didn't self-sustain and fell apart. But there was one thing that was very amazing about the Soviet Union was that every woman had three years of maternity leave, yes, uh, paid maternity leave. So the majority of women had opportunity to stay home for three up to three years and nurse the babies, uh, raise uh, the children. And I think uh, at that time, uh, the skeletal structures were developing much better. And when you look at today's literature, uh, any child that is breastfed less than six months has a significant higher rate of maxillary deficiency. Uh, 
uh, not even to mention uh, other systemic uh, health issues that they may have. Uh, so I think breastfeeding is very critical and unfortunately in the United States, instead of uh, uh, supporting maternity leave, uh, the government chose to give every woman, uh, every mother uh, breast pump, which does not replace the natural uh, uh, physiologic function of uh, breastfeeding and the importance of it. Uh, so I think uh, the more we learn about this and how important it is, I think the more we should be uh, pressuring the United States government and other governments in the world to, uh, to make a change and support women that are raising young children. And uh, then in terms of the diet, I think uh, the sugar is a very big uh, problem. I think a lot of children are introduced uh, to fermentable carbohydrates and sugar from a very young age. And I think this is something that every parent has full control in uh, not giving their children sugar until after age at least three. Uh, so the culture is the problem. It's all cultural, right? Uh, grandparents uh, uh, bringing candy to, to young children. So the other thing is the pacifier. The pacifier is so easy to eliminate. No baby is born asking for a pacifier. The pacifier is for the parent. Mm -hmm. You can eliminate pacifier. You can eliminate sugar and soft foods. If you can introduce like harder meat to a child, like meat on the bone, like lamb, or lamb chop or veal chop or any type of steak type of meat. Uh, if you can introduce like carrots uh, from, uh, from a very young age, like uh, sucking on a stem of pineapple, it's a very good uh, fruit to kind of develop uh, proprioception, uh, develop uh, uh, proper tongue function and swallowing rather than to give a child like a pacifier or any type of uh, uh, other like soft uh, snacks. Yeah, I do not. I'm not a very big proponent of any of those uh, packaged pureed foods or uh, any type of those uh, dry fruits that melt in your mouth. They have nothing that they offer for the muscular uh, development and muscular activity. So there are a lot of things that can be uh, revisited in terms of uh, uh, food uh, industry for younger children and also uh, what uh, you can do at home. And I also think that a lot of the problem is the postural changes in children. All of these uh, devices that we developed to uh, including the car seat yeah. to uh, hold the child uh, under the age of one. It doesn't really help with the proper development of the head posture uh, and uh, as soon as the child can hold something in their hand, they can hold an iPad and they are no longer exploring the world by looking around, they are exploring the world from the iPad or the iPhone. So I think so many little things that can be done uh, that may change, uh, make, a, make a big change in how the face is growing. Yes, so that's no, I, I agree with you. I know a lot of it is convenience and culturally driven. And, you know, I'm, we've talked many episodes on here about, you know, a food pouch, maybe if you're in an absolute dilemma in an emergency, and you have to grab it off the store shelf to feed your child something like on occasion, fine. But for it to be their stable, you know, diet that they're eating every day is just, it's, if you look at the ingredients in those pouches, they're not healthy. Um, they're often applesauce based and completely full of sugar. And so, um, you know, and this is not to shame any mother. This is just information that we're sharing, but we've talked a lot about this and about other ways that you can achieve, you know, giving your child harder textures early on in safe ways, you know, to mm -hmm. develop them to a while also, you know, yes, puree has a place, but it shouldn't, they shouldn't only be eating purees for the first six months of life either. It needs to be a combination. So um, I think the conversation is getting started out there and there's a lot of different, you know, moms and therapists on, they've got lots of uh, information that they're sharing. So I, I'm hoping that we, we start to make some big changes here, but it would be nice if the government would give mothers time off to 
breastfeed their children and actually raise their children versus, you know, causing that additional stress in the mother's life of having to try and figure out how to feed their child and work. Um, Because that, that again, culturally is a big issue here. And, you know, the other thing that you brought up is the pacifier. And it's, I actually made a Instagram post like a month or two ago where I wrote, pacifiers are not a milestone. (laughs) Because I think that parents automatically think like, here are the things I have to buy for my baby. And a pacifier is always one of the first things on that list. And I'm here going, babies don't need pacifiers. And, you know, and I know that in the U.S., the whole, um, I think the whole stance on it is that it's supposed to help prevent sudden infant death syndrome. And I'm going, if we're trying to prevent SIDS in babies, maybe we should be looking at their airway. Because I do believe there is some research that's been done in this space that has demonstrated these, and it's not a ton of research and it's not large groups of babies that have been studied, but I think there was one specifically, I was talking with a colleague the other day um, who was presenting to us and something along the lines of, you know, this group of babies that were studied after passing, unfortunately, they all had restricted airways. And, you know, that really is the, the issue here. It's not that they're suddenly passing with no health issues. Nobody's looking at, the baby holistically. Nobody's looking at the baby's airway and their orofacial structures. And if we start doing that at birth, we can prevent these issues versus trying to study them after they happen. So, you know, it's an interesting topic. It's a very touchy one. Um, I know parents just want to sleep and they think that, you know, it'll pacify the baby so they can sleep. And so, you know, I, I basically say by six months, if you're using one, you better get that out. <laughs> and if you're using it, it better not be flat. It needs to be nice and rounded so the tongue can at least cup around it and develop some, some you know, skills. But aside from that, you know, we really advise no pacifier. And so I love to hear that come from, from you because I know there's also this whole discussion around the orthodontic pacifier and how, you know, oh, the parents, you know, I've got a lot of parents on my account who have said to me, well, my orthodontist or my dentist, you know, they said that I should use this pacifier because it's not going to mess up the shape of the palate. And I basically go back and say, look, it's holding your baby's tongue down. That's not where we want the tongue, no matter what shape the pacifier is. So ideally, no pacifier is better than anything on the market. And there's a reason why there's a major lawsuit against one of the big companies who put out an orthodontic pacifier, uh, Mm -hmm. because they found it's actually very harmful to toddlers who continue to use them. So very interesting discussions surrounding this topic. But you know, it's, um, it's definitely a conversation we need to continue because culturally, I think we've, like you said, we've got a lot of big changes to make. And they start they start as soon as that baby comes out of the womb so we need to be looking in that mouth day one yeah well totally agree yeah yeah well this has been amazing mariana is there any any last thoughts that you want to share with us before we we finish today oh, I, I think i covered uh, everything i wanted to cover today thank you so much for inviting me if anyone has questions uh, they can always find me on uh, I'm the Infinity Dental Specialist. This is our practice name uh, website, or they can email me directly. I will put, uh, again, the slide as my email. Perfect. And we will also put in the show notes um, your email and the Facebook group, um, as well as your website, so that if they have, they want to reach out or, you know, contact you, they can definitely. So my email is mevans at infinityorthopedia.com. And... Um, Mm, let me see here. And uh, they can also always text me or contact me through Facebook as well. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, thanks, Mariana. Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you want to hear more of these Mayo Tots airway and feeding related episodes, be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or pledge a small amount on patreon.com forward slash the untethered podcast. If you found value, others you know in this space will too. So be sure to share this episode on your social media platforms and join us over on Facebook, on my Facebook page at Hallie Balkan Biz, on Instagram at, at Hallie Balkan. And you can head over to the untethered podcast.com to grab a copy of the show notes um, where you can also subscribe to be kept up to date on the latest podcast episodes. 